Gresham College presents What Has the City Ever Done for Us? by the Right Honourable Lord Mayor of London, David Wooten. Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm Roderick Flood, the Provost of Gresham College, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the annual lecture by the President of the College, the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor. Um, and congratulations on having got here and surviving the bus strike. Um, the city has, in the course of over seven centuries, created, or perhaps accreted is the best word, a large number of traditions. Um, the origins of them, many of them are lost in the mists of time. Although a cynical historian like myself might speculate that many are actually much less venerable than is believed by those who observe them. Most of our traditions, one has to say, were invented by the Victorians. Um, however, we can be entirely precise, unusually, about the origins of the annual lecture given by the Lord Mayor, the President of the College. It's three years old. Um, <laughs> The lectures so far have been most interesting and successful and we're sure that that will be the case today and, that the, and we very much hope therefore that the tradition will be established and will become a regular feature of the Lord Mayor's year. Like all Gresham lectures, this one attracts an excellent audience despite tube bus strikes. Over 20,000 people have attended our lectures in the City of London in the academic years nearly ending, an average of over 150 for each lecture. But as I often repeat, this number is dwarfed by the much larger number, over 1.1 million in fact, who download a lecture from our website or other sources each year. This number is rising rapidly, continues to rise rapidly as Gresham lectures are accessed in many different ways. And it's a sign of our worldwide reach. Most of the audience naturally are in English speaking countries, but many are not. Gresham and its sponsors, the City of London Corporation and the Mercers Company, are thus becoming known far beyond the wildest dreams of that far-sighted man, Sir Thomas Gresham, our founder. So if I may anticipate the Lord Mayor's lecture, one answer, I'm sure he's got many, but one answer to the question in his title, what has the city ever done for us, is that it gave us Gresham College. David Wooten is the 684th Lord Mayor of London, and he's now nearly three quarters of the way through what's been the most successful mayoralty. He's negotiated with very great skill and strength the, the Queen's Jubilee and many associated events. And the Olympics, of course, are still to come and will be another occasion together with his foreign visits, one next week, I believe, in which the mayoralty is seen to represent London and indeed Britain. David is in an excellent position to answer his own question. He has since 1979 been a partner in Allen and Overy, one of the largest and most international of our law firms based in the city. He's held many voluntary positions both inside and outside the city and he's been a member of the city corporation since 2002. I have great pleasure Lord Mayor in inviting you to deliver your lecture. Groucho Marx, why should I care about posterity? What's posterity ever done for me? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome you to Guildhall, a building which has stood at the heart of the city's commitment to commerce, charity and community for 600 years. Guildhall embodies the unique heritage, diversity and leadership of the City of London. It is therefore a great backdrop for my talk, what has the city ever done for us? I have no doubt that the Python fans out there among you will recognize instantly my tribute to that immortal line 
What Have the Romans Ever Done for Us? uttered by the great John Cleese in The Life of Brian. We're all familiar with the ironic humour of this skit. The People's Front of Judea are irked to have their pithy slogan thrown off course by trifling little details of what the Romans actually had done, such as sanitation, medicine, education, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system, public health. Now, it's right and proper that any authority should be considered in this way. What have they ever done for us? Only then can we ensure that an authority's objectives and outcomes remain on course and that it remains strong and sustainable for the future. The city has certainly not endured for so many hundreds of years by sticking its head in the sand or by running a system which benefits very few and leaves the rest by the wayside or by refusing to evolve and adapt to best serve the needs of its communities. Ladies and gentlemen, none of these things are good business sense. The word sustainability is overused, but there are times when it is impossible to avoid it. And this is one of those times. The city cannot be strong and it cannot be successful without being sustainable. This means building healthy communities and supporting those most in need. In the bicentennial year of Charles Dickens and as a Lord Mayor who is also chairman of the Charles Dickens Museum in Bloomsbury, I note that one of Dickens' central themes is the connection between every member and every level of society, especially the responsibility of the haves to the have-nots. Times have changed, but this message is just as important today. The city knows its responsibilities and its vital connections to industry, to those in need and to our nation. As Lord Mayor, I am fulfilling the role of the front man, the man on stage. But if I do well, it's only because I can call on the goodwill and support of so many. During the recent Diamond Jubilee celebrations, I congratulated myself on remaining unfazed by the madcap mayoral schedule and an official duties which required a PhD in ceremonial. Until my wife commented coolly, if you can stay calm while all around you is chaos, then you probably haven't completely understood the situation. <laughs> it is therefore my responsibility and my privilege to shine a light on the enormous amount of hard work and goodwill that goes on in less prominent or public ways. I call it good by stealth. And when I began my mayoralty, the Minister for the Civil Society, Nick Hurd, said to me, the city has to help the government by making the case for the city and making a noise doing it. I agreed. The city has taken a battering from the media in recent times. The flames of public outrage at perceived inequalities and errors have been ignited and fanned. And yet I know there is no shortage of excellent work on which to shine a light. The city has a very, very long history of philanthropy married with commercial activity. For example, the City of London Corporation established and supports academies in Islington, Southwark and Hackney with multi-million pound gifts, enabling children from some of the most deprived communities in the UK to benefit from a first-class education and the support needed to achieve success. And over the past 15 years, the corporation's charity, the City Bridge Trust, has given grants of a quarter of a billion pounds to charities across Greater London. These charities are small, grassroots organisations which serve very specific needs. For example, the Fear and Fashion Partnership, initiated by the Trust to tackle increasing knife crime in London and supported with a £1 million investment. 
Soon after the project began, a teenager from one of the participating schools was stabbed and killed. One of his best friends, considering revenge, was counselled against this downward spiral by a project leader. He was encouraged and helped to progress in sport and as a result now represents Great Britain in judo. The Trust has also given over £100,000 to fund the Coping Through Football project, which improves physical and social well-being for those with mental health needs. Almost all participants who were previously drug and alcohol dependent have been helped to get clean, and almost half of participants are now in education, employment or training. The Trust's seed corn funding is the targeted, practical support which is often needed most. Our city livery companies also operate in this way, with targeted gifts designed to serve specific needs for a sustained period of time and make a real difference for the future. The Building Crafts College in Newham, supported by the Carpenters Livery Company, is providing skills, aspiration and hope to young people from a community with high unemployment. The skills they gain will help build up this community and contribute to the Thames Gateway regeneration for decades to come. In 1907, Lord Mayor William Trelaw founded an appeal for children with non-pulmonary tuberculosis, building a hospital and school with support from the livery. Over a hundred years later, Trelaw's is one of the most advanced specialist schools for disabled children in the world, and its enormous costs are still met with significant help from the livery. Then, as now, the livery has the fleetness of foot and sheer gumption to use its resources to tackle some of the most difficult challenges facing our society. This year, I have seen many projects spring up in support of young people and sports, spurred on by the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. I hope these initiatives will be part of a lasting legacy beyond the Games, inspiring and investing in many more young sportsmen and women. But I also have real admiration for those who have invested in the years building up to the Games, such as the Great 12 livery companies who have identified and supported promising young athletes for many years. In one instance, just providing the petrol money enabled an aspiring hurdler to make the weekly trip to the best trainer in the country. Another beneficiary said, with the support I've been given, this is the first time in my life that I can afford to eat the way my coach wants me to. This sort of intervention may not even occur to many of us, but thanks to those who are using their particular knowledge of particular needs, making their giving as effective as possible, and enhancing monetary gifts with practical action, we are seeing real results. In this instance, several athletes made such startling progress that they have either qualified for or are on the edge of the British team. The livery are an enormous force for good, a responsibility born for hundreds of years. They are the living embodiment of connections in the city, championing their professions, trades and crafts, often with roots deep into the regions and forming a network across every sector of business and the city. And they do a huge amount to support people into education, employment and training, as well as initiating and funding a broad spectrum of charitable projects. I could spend the entire day listing their many successes and the many ways in which we have all benefited from their quiet yet immensely powerful support. City businesses also do an enormous amount to support and invest in their communities. Through funding and more importantly through an invaluable contribution of their business skills and talent. This attitude is integral to city business. The concept of reinvestment in community is not a new one, although it may be rebranded and badged as such. Since the very origins of the city trade, there has been social investment through apprenticeships, 
education, charitable donations, all helping to improve the health of a business's community and therefore the longevity of the business itself. Over the past 20 years, the concept of corporate social responsibility, CSR, social investment, whatever they're calling it at present, has brought together and progressed many different strands of business engagement. The private sector has made a huge contribution to economic and social regeneration in the city and its neighbouring boroughs at the initiative of the private sector itself. Just looking at the contribution made by business members of the City of London Corporation CSR programme, I know that thousands of volunteers from city businesses are supporting hundreds of community organisations, tackling homelessness, unemployment, literacy, mental health, discrimination and disability, providing opportunity and hope. These are just the businesses signed up to the corporations programmes. There are many more who carry out excellent in-depth CSR programmes of their own. As a long-serving partner of Alan and Overy, I know that this is certainly something that my firm has prioritised. And I know firsthand the enormous benefits of investing in communities, employees and the environment. Our Smart Start programme runs workshops and challenges for young people from disadvantaged communities, providing an insight into the world of work and providing essential business and life skills. We want to show them that they are the city workers of the future and to remove obstacles in their path to their chosen career. Business knows that this is not just an investment in the health, growth and future of their own business, but also an important contribution to the wider economy and wider society. And as any successful business person knows, truly sustainable investment, that word again, is cyclical. If we do not build strong, healthy communities, we will not have the pool of talent which we rely upon to keep our city and nation strong and create the stability and prosperity to build even stronger, healthier communities. I recently visited the Hoxton Apprentice restaurant in Hackney, an excellent example of a social enterprise. In recent times, charities and social organisations have become more sophisticated and sustainable in their approach. Years ago, our heartstrings were tugged by images or descriptions of a particular need, and we dug deep, gave money to the cause, and continued with our lives. Nowadays, the third sector is exploring new ways to fund its work and tackle issues for the long term, not just by resolving immediate needs, but also by taking a holistic approach in order to tackle and resolve the cause of those needs. Social enterprises combine business and charity for the benefit of both. Hoxton Apprentice managed by Training for Life, is an exemplar social enterprise, innovative and commercially viable. Training and work experience is provided to the long-term unemployed, while top-notch food is provided to paying customers. The restaurant has been a huge success and profits are reinvested to fund the training programmes. Earlier this year, we celebrated the launch of a new property investment fund to support the work done by London's leading homeless charity, Broadway, to help rough sleepers find permanent accommodation. Private landlords lease to the charity properties for sublets to the homeless, and the private sector is now contributing further through the new fund, which will purchase hundreds of flats for Broadway's real lettings, an excellent example of social investment and an effective relationship between the private and third sectors to meet an urgent community need. A very different set of affairs to those experienced by one chap who found himself in reduced circumstances some centuries ago. After a number of nights under the stars, he happened upon a roadside inn with a sign reading 
George and the Dragon. He knocked. The innkeeper's wife stuck her head out of the window. Could ye spare me some victuals? he asked. The woman glanced at his shabby, dirty clothes. No, clear off, she shouted. Could I have a pint of ale? No, she shouted. Could I at least sleep in your stable? No, just get lost, she shouted again. The vagabond said, might I please? What now, screeched the woman, not allowing him to finish. Do you suppose, he asked, that I might have a word with George? <laughs> the city of London's crest unites the cross of St. George and the Dragon. A reminder of the legend and the role of the city to protect and to serve. And each year, the Lord Mayor's Dragon Awards recognise some of the best community projects carried out by city businesses. When considering all the excellent social enterprises that the city makes possible, remember that the city is a social enterprise. I've often been asked by people in the city to draw attention to our good works, but in my humble opinion, we should start the other way round. I'm, as Lord Mayor, I'm not in the business of offsetting what is sometimes perceived as the murky and mysterious world of the city by imploring you to consider all the very good work it funds and therefore judge the city more kindly. No, I'm inviting you instead to have a right and better of appreciation of what the city is. In recent times, we have seen great suspicion about the role of business. There's a running argument between financial stability at one end of the spectrum and jobs and growth at the other, but the two are not mutually exclusive. The city is crucial for our future prosperity. I often hear the suggestion that Britain's economy must rebalance, implying that the city and financial services at one end of the seesaw must move down for other sectors to move up, but this is not a zero-sum game. One depends on the other. We must continue to diversify our economy so that we grow all sectors. We cannot create jobs and we cannot create growth in the wider economy without finance and without capital, and we will not have finance or capital without the City of London. As Lord Mayor, I will travel to almost 30 countries this year, championing UK financial, professional and business services, the city brand. I lead a delegation of British business leaders to each country, helping them to secure new contracts for infrastructure and exports and facilitating investment into the UK. This will create jobs and growth here in the UK and strengthen the global uh, economy. Uh, you will see, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, the real purpose of, this, purpose of this lecture is to get the highest number of pictures of me on the screen. But the city is not focused on international markets to the exclusion of domestic ones because the city is not just the square mile, it is the whole of financial and professional services, almost two million jobs across the UK. The series of satellite centres for finance in the regions, hubs of business which serve and are served by the City of London itself. When I led a business visit to Wales last year, I was struck by the excellent appreciation there of our interdependence for mutual growth. The job in London is not seen in Cardiff as being at the expense of a job there. It is more likely to mean an additional job in Cardiff. There is a strong perception that if we do well, they do well, and if they do well, we will do well. A strong city means more opportunities for investment, more jobs and more growth across the UK. This message was reiterated during visits to my hometown of Bradford, as well as Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, the Isle of Man, Belfast, Stoke-on-Trent and Southampton, in fact, wherever I go in the UK. 
one of the most senior business people in Belfast told me that the Belfast economy was dependent, his word, dependent, on the City of London's financial services doing well. And to use Belfast as an example, when Citigroup moved their financial technology group to Northern Ireland four years ago, there were attractive locations available to them outside the UK. However, they recognised the value of remaining in the UK and remaining plugged into the City of London's pool of talent and capital. Citigroup has prospered. As a result, just four years ago, they had 375 employees in Belfast. Now they have 1,500 in both technology and legal compliance, a major contribution to jobs and growth in the area. Wherever I go in the world, the city is held in very high regard. They know the city is the preeminent financial centre with a time zone conducive to international business, excellent links to Europe and the Middle East, cutting edge communications infrastructure, a stable regulatory and political environment, and a rich and diverse talent pool. All positioned within a unique, historic and contemporary urban landscape which attracts people to live and work here from all over the world. During my recent visit to Canada, our commercial partners there just did not understand the coverage they see here talking the city down. It's our job to talk it up. And this is something I have been doing as much as possible and through a variety of media. Giving speeches and lectures are all very well, but interviews and articles do present more of a challenge. On occasion, I'm tempted again to echo Groucho Marx. Please quote me as saying I was misquoted. As I said, many people try to justify the importance of the city by giving examples of the volunteering, mentoring and philanthropy it carries out. This is all good stuff, but the argument is facing the wrong way. All these good works are only possible because of the wealth producing sector, because of financial services they are all derivatives of the city. The city is about wealth creation and we should celebrate that fact. When did wealth become unworthy? We must get away from a subconscious emotion encouraged by the media that morality and honesty equate to poverty and penury. It, is it not better to generate wealth, generate jobs and growth which can create a better standard of life for all? I'm pleased to say that's not me. We have a common overriding national and international mission, the creation of prosperity, the creation of economic growth and the creation of jobs, jobs that provide security for our fellow citizens and stability for our communities. We live in a society which is accustomed to certain basic necessities which some countries would deem luxuries. We benefit from education, infrastructure and healthcare, which is among the best in the world. And we expect nothing less than the best. But how do we expect to pay for it? How else do we expect to provide every individual, regardless of background, with access to the education, infrastructure and healthcare, which will enable them to achieve success in their lives? Let us not buy into the myth of morality means poverty. We often hear people advocating a more simple life, but is that really what they want? Over the past 40 years, infant mortality rates have decreased by three quarters. And meanwhile, a far greater number of people have access to education and training than ever before. Let us accept that we have an expectation about lifestyles. My point is that we cannot then disassociate where those lifestyles come from. We cannot avoid economics and still enjoy good things. There's been a great deal of scrutiny of the city, rather more than of the role of government 
regulators or indeed ordinary citizens. Part of the reason is that the city is easy to blame and provides a good distraction from fault elsewhere. While executive pay can create problems and inequalities, it did not cause the crisis. And this issue is being addressed by shareholders responding to public concern by ensuring remuneration is linked to long-term success, not short-term gain. The next step is not to abolish the city or treat banks as arms of the civil service. This is a blinkered view of what the city exists to do. A properly calibrated, well-judged risk is the essence of any sound business decision. It's the city and the UK's financial and professional and business services which make public services possible. Financial services create wealth, and wealth is the water which creates growth, makes possible our public services and creates jobs across our economy, from the manufacturing sector to maritime services. Proper and prudent management of the public finances is itself an essential precondition for a successful market economy. An increasing public expenditure will not lead of itself to growth and jobs, but it certainly means a continuing and an unsustainable public debt. Growth will come from private sector, enterprise, innovation and energy, supported by government measures to provide the stability, clarity and predictability that business must have. I recently visited Stoke-on-Trent, a good example of entrepreneurship achieving real growth. The potteries are crucial to employment in the area and through their large and increasing export orders are also making an important contribution to the wider UK economy. Yes, that is me. I met the leaders of 10 pottery businesses and heard that their sector would benefit hugely from an origin mark, recognising and increasing the value of their products and desirable for international consumers. The government needs to create regulations which will make and keep business competitive. Throughout the UK, I have seen innovative, world-beating businesses, big, small, export-based, with excellent products, staff, market penetration, and no apparent difficulty in getting funding. As Lord Mayor, I'm an ambassador for all UK business and I spend a great deal of time promoting UK expertise in technology, engineering, design, creative industries, project management as well as financing and all UK manufacturing. After all, we are the sixth largest manufacturing country by value in the world and this industry has great importance for our success, as do financial and professional services. There will always be a need for bankers to provide capital, for accountants to monitor it and for insurers to keep it safe. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, we all hear the word sustainability until it begins to lack weight or meaning. But don't underestimate the importance of true sustainability. True, long-termist, responsible, effective action and investment. Not just handing something on, but making it better. This is the role of the city. This is what the city has done well for hundreds of years. And this is what the city does well because it has done it for hundreds of years. I am relieved, pleased and proud that we do not have a city which has been cowed by every mood and fad of the day. Instead, the city has embraced and nurtured a rich diversity of business services, a unique cluster, by building on its long experience and expertise. The livery companies are a microcosm of the city. They're not involved directly in manufacturing, but they make important and valuable contributions to the manufacturing sector through investment in their trades and crafts. Crucially, through bursaries, apprenticeships and award schemes which ensure that these skills are preserved and passed on for the future. 
This long-termism, whereby funding is maximised through mentoring and other practical hands-on support, is sowing a seed for the future. I am delighted that the livery was at the heart of the celebrations of Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee, out in force at the lunch for Her Majesty in Westminster Hall. 85 liveries were represented and 530 of the guests, four-fifths of everyone there, were not members of the liveries but members of the charities, schools, trades, crafts and uniform services which the livery supports. What a testament to the priorities and meaning of the livery. With roots in medieval times, the livery, the, the old guilds, have nurtured their industries through education, training and mentoring. So too does the city follow long-term business prospects. This approach may be the reason why the city does not always get its message across. We should not chase headlines or devote ourselves to short-term popularity, but build on what has gone before in order to achieve a better future. Our city is, and has always been, a world leader. Thanks to the Lloyds Insurance Market, the Baltic Exchange and Shipping, the London Stock Exchange and other unique institutions, this is where the world comes to do business. And our competitive advantage was increased by the opening of the new commercial court in Fetter Lane last year, the largest and best equipped business court in the world. This was one of the most important events for London and the UK in recent history. The court reinforces the UK's world-leading legal services sector and the city's position as the foremost global centre for financial, professional and business services. And I have seen firsthand how highly regarded the court is across the world. I am incredibly proud of everything our city has achieved and everything our city stands for. Our stock stands high across the world. We simply cannot afford to hamper our competitiveness and we must be able to make bold, responsible decisions for future benefit. We cannot blow on the breezes of discontent, making sweeping indiscriminate decisions to slap one risk, one wrist and risk felling many by straitjacketing our competitive advantage. What will we achieve by taking something away from those we perceive to have too much, we could give it all away. But when it has gone, where do we get more from? The Olympic torch, currently on its journey through the UK, is passed on with pride from one carrier to another, from one Olympic nation to another. But this is preservation, not sustainability. We in the city are in the business of building on what has gone before, in order to preserve the best of the past while ensuring a stable and secure future. This is real stewardship. A lot of people think that the city is about short-term gain over long-term benefit, but no one has a monopoly on the concept of sustainability. The city is a vital part of our economic ecosystem, funding the infrastructure at the heart of our communities from hospitals to home. We're producing better medical care, better maternity care, better quality of life, and this is sustainability. Indeed, the eminent Gresham College, its professors and affiliated academics, and its prestigious lecture series for the public benefit for over 400 years was made possible by a former Lord Mayor, Sir Richard Gresham. He had the vision to build an exchange in London to rival the Antwerp Bourse, a vision realised by his son, Sir Thomas Gresham. The Royal Exchange was built in the 16th century and Sir Thomas was appointed Royal Agent in Antwerp. His mansion in Bishopsgate was the first home of the eponymous Gresham College, whose professor's salaries were met by the rental income from shops around the Royal Exchange, bequeathed by Sir Thomas to the City of London Corporation and the Mercers Company. 
Gresham's sustained and sustainable investment not only created an exchange which helped maintain and enhance the city and the UK as the preeminent hub for trade and industry, but also founded and supported a college which would nurture and disseminate knowledge and expertise for the edification and continued development of our city. This is the sort of investment where it is impossible to measure the return and yet the return is priceless. Sir Thomas, like so many of the city fathers, was playing the long game. He knew that the city would endure and excel only with a ready stock of informed and informative individuals replenishing the city's businesses and public services with a rich pool of talent envied all over the world. And this is indeed the case today. Due to the many city institutions and educational establishments founded and supported by city philanthropists, businesses and livery companies in order to create a healthy, sustainable city at the centre of our nation's cultural life. The city's universities and academies, the Barbican, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, the Museum of London, the London Symphony Orchestra, Hampstead Heath, Epping Forest and many other green spaces make our city a hub for the creative industries and a very desirable place to live, study and work. As the Financial Times said just yesterday, the City of London opens space to the public, almost 11,000 acres to be precise, and improves it, as it has been doing for over a century, often in alliance with local people against intrusive developers. As I said at the beginning, I'm greatly enjoying the chance to have my year on the stage as Lord Mayor and the chance to champion the city's cause for the benefit of us all. And I'm very relieved that today I did not meet the same fate as someone else who recently gave a 40-minute lecture. Unfortunately for him, he was preceded immediately by me with a few opening remarks on the subject, which was dispute resolution. I spoke for a short while and promptly hopped off the stage, gathering up my script as I left. The keynote speaker, a lawyer from Allen and Overy, then gave his lengthy address to great acclaim. Only afterwards did I realize that in my haste, I had swept up his speech as well as my own and he had delivered his lecture entirely without notes. I am very glad that he did not persuade the Honourable Gresham staff to return the favour today, <laughs> as I fear you would have been less convinced and complimentary than his audience were. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming to listen to the 2012 Lord Mayor's Gresham Lecture here in Guildhall, and I hope you've enjoyed this event as much as I have enjoyed reflecting on the role, contribution and connections of our great city. Thank you very much indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Mayor has kindly agreed to answer questions for a few minutes. Um, but before he does so, and while you're thinking of those questions, may I thank him very much for a fascinating talk. I, I think I was reflecting during it that it seemed to me that he was actually being quite modest about the achievements and contribution of the city and the, of the corporation. And I'm very glad that at the end he, he came up with my favourite examples, which are certainly the, the open spaces of London, Hampstead Heath, Epping Forest and the others, where the city, in my experience, enters into obligations vowing not to spend money on them and then, because it thinks they're good things, spends a great deal of money on them. Um, and uh, I invite you to go to Hampstead Heath if you want to see examples of, of what that has done or what the city has done in taking over that uh, great open space for Londoners. 
Um, are there any questions for the Lord Mayor? Um, my name is Eleanor Allen. This year has obviously been a, a year um, Lord Mayor, of great achievements for you in the city, but you haven't uh, touched on the one some of us might see, think of as a nasty spot, and that was the demonstrations before Christmas. So if you could touch on that now, maybe. Thank you. Uh, the uh, city uh, is uh, quite happy with uh, protests it has uh, dealt with uh, and uh, uh, responded to uh, protests down the centuries. It has been uh, very welcoming uh, down the centuries to uh, new uh, ideas, whether business or uh, political, from uh, all parts of the world. The best collection of left-wing political literature in Europe is, in fact, in the city of London, in the Bishopsgate Library, mm -hmm. uh, just on uh, uh, Bishopsgate. Uh, and every, uh, at least European, uh, and sometimes American, uh, revolutionary that you can think of, Marx, Lenin, Guevara, etc., spent quite a lot of time there. Uh, so protest is uh, fine. Uh, protest that uh, interferes with other people's uh, lives uh, and livelihoods uh, and their ability to uh, uh, go about their uh, lawful activities uh, and which does not appear to respect other people's rights is uh, not fine. Uh, nor is what is said to be protest, but struggles in vain to articulate any coherent narrative about what the protest is actually against or for. Uh, and the city was very uh, respectful of the uh, rights, uh, and we are an extremely tolerant country in this regard, far more tolerant than most other countries in the world, uh, including some uh, um, the most democratic countries. Uh, during that process, we were very respectful of, of the uh, uh, rights of prospectors, uh, pr the protesters, uh, despite the irritations, but we waited in vain, uh, despite uh, a large number of people uh, who they regarded as the, the, the enemy, uh, having lengthy discussions with them, we waited in vain for anything coherent uh, coming the other way. Uh, and although uh, there are elements, in particular in our media, who, who, who love uh, to latch on to uh, protests like that and try and accord uh, some coherence to them, uh, and there were many instances of people who have views, particularly about the city and business and capitalism, uh, uh, taking the opportunity to latch on and say, well, I've now discovered what the process is about, and it happens to coincide with exactly the views that I've been expressing over the last 10 years, or lots of those. But, but, but it, it, the reason it petered out uh, in, in, in the end in substance was because it, 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 it never produced any, any worthwhile thought. Uh, that was uh, uh, useful to take forward, which was a disappointment because we're always looking one way or another for new ideas. Reminds me, if I may say, of a student occupation at uh, what was then London Guildhall University where I, as I was being evicted from my office of the Vice-Chancellor, I said to the student protesters, well, all right, what do you want? And they said, I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> Um, any more questions? My Lord Mayor, the Provost rightly said you were perhaps somewhat modest. Um, you also quoted Groucho Marx and posterity, and I just wondered how, albeit only partway through your year, you would see, looking back on your year, what you had done for posterity for the city. Well, that's a very kind thing. I, I, uh, I am uh, but a mere uh, temporary holder of a great uh, office. Uh, it is very easy uh, to become confused uh, into thinking that all the attention which is lavished on uh, 
the Lord Mayor of the day is something to do with his or her personal qualities. Uh, and it isn't. It's to do with the way uh, everyone in the city and the personal qualities of the office holders uh, down uh, the centuries uh, have produced an office which attracts uh, such uh, attention. It is the, uh, the archetypal long-term uh, team uh, effort. Uh, I think uh, this, this year uh, will be uh, seen uh, as the city being a central part of, of uh, the nation at, if you like, a high level, uh, the city for reasons of both history and uh, current uh, prominence having an integral and major part to play in, in uh, the major events of, uh, of the nation. And I think you will see that again uh, in the uh, Olympic Games. Uh, s s secondly, uh, I think you will see, uh, uh, I hesitate to use the word turning of the tide, that's far too strong, but, it, but it's, it, it, you will see a, uh, uh, that people notice that the city started to uh, give out more messages than it had in the past that the city of London was not uh, separate uh, from the rest of the country, that it was interested in what the rest of the country was doing uh, and interested in what other sectors uh, of the uh, economy uh, have been doing. Over the last 10 or 20 years, the city has focused increasingly on a, on a narrower agenda of financial services. Uh, the city wasn't alone. The government was doing that. Everyone was doing that. Why wouldn't you? It was going so well. Well, when it ceases, uh, to go uh, so well when there are issues, we have to, if you like, reconnect. Uh, and that, uh, that's been one uh, uh, theme. Uh, and the other one is uh, a greater emphasis on other parts uh, of the community uh, than just uh, the pure business uh, uh, part and the pure day-to-day uh, -day job, if I can put it that way, but on education, uh, training. I'm, if you look at the world of education, uh, where for the last 40 or 50 years, the trend for both education regions and I think social policy regions has been away from uh, um, vocational things and in favor uh, of just academic education at various uh, levels, a reversal uh, of that and the flow back towards apprenticeships, uh, vocational training, uh, and more suiting of individual jobs and careers to uh, individual uh, talents. So I would hope that in the future people would see me as having made a very modest contribution uh, to those three particular themes. Uh, thank you. My name is John Hume. Lord Mayor, um, in the midst of what's still a very serious uh, financial crisis, what role can the city play in restoring the tarnished reputation of the financial and banking sectors? Thank you. Uh, the, the, uh, thank you very much. The, the, the easy uh, thing to say is, is, is to get its banks lending again. Uh, and. Uh, the, the reason that's an easy thing to say is because everybody recognises it's much more uh, complicated uh, than uh, is sometimes uh, thought. But the, the better way of putting the answer, of which that is a part, uh, is uh, the, the city taking more steps uh, and being seen to take more steps uh, to uh, encourage the economy uh, forward, uh, the making availability, the making available of credit, uh, the making available of other forms of financing or uh, financial uh, products, the uh, investing of uh, city uh, investment uh, funds in activities, manufacturing, creative industries, all sorts of things which create uh, real jobs, including investing in 
apprenticeships and opportunities uh, for the future. Uh, so uh, more uh, activities uh, which have a direct uh, impact uh, on uh, the economy, particularly on jobs short and uh, long term. Uh, one of the, I did refer in the lecture to one of the difficulties that the financial world has. It is appalling uh, at getting its uh, case uh, across. Uh, the Chancellor recently complained in public that having been lobbied privately for a long time by business to reduce the top rate of income tax from 50% when he took what he regarded, well he was right, the politically bold decision actually to do it, knowing that from his left hand, as it were, there would be a deluge of criticism, he turned round and looked for those who'd urged him to do it in private and they're nowhere to be seen. And that is a genuine point. Uh, uh, the, uh, so, so, some, sometimes um, good statements come from rather unexpected sources. The president of Niger in uh, sub-Saharan Africa came to lunch, all in a day's work for a law mayor, of course, came to lunch at Mansion House uh, and a French speaker. Uh, he, uh, we were discussing this uh, problem. Uh, which he diagnosed, he said, uh, Lord Mayor, uh, l'argent n'aime pas le bruit. Money does not like noise. And I've been struggling to find the words to say that, 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 that the financial world, whether it's bankers or lawyers or accountants, everybody in the financial world likes to keep their head down because they think they prosper down the centuries just as the city livery companies do they think they prosper. They're right by keeping their head down, but when others have got their heads up, it doesn't work. So it's two things. One is being more economically active in, in, in uh, things which will produce jobs and making more noise about it. Uh, rather, than to, ra rather than saying, I'm a banker, love me. That, the, direct approach, <laughs> the direct approach doesn't do it. Lord Mayor, I think we uh, don't have time for any more questions. Um, I was told earlier that this is one of about a thousand speeches that you make during your year of office, or you and your uh, predecessors and successors make. So thank you so much for devoting one thousandth or less of your time <laughs> to uh, us today. Um, we do appreciate the uh, Lord Mayor's role as president of the college. Um, and we appreciate very much the support, of course, that the corporation and the Mercer's Company give to the college, and we think and hope that we give good value in return. But thank you so much for coming today, and good luck with the rest of your year. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.